Hey guys, Mr. Antoon here. Hope you're doing well. Uh, we're going to finish up Chapter 5 with, on Civil Rights, Sections 4 through 7. So again, let's talk about the rights of women, and then we'll do some other groups after this. Remember, civil rights are based on the 14th Amendment, really the Equal Protection and Due Process Clauses. So <clears throat> let's trace some of their rights that they've had or struggled with. Back in 1848, they created a document called the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions that was like the Declaration of Independence, talking about the suffrage of women, the lack of suffrage, meaning they didn't have the right to vote. So it all began in 1840s for that. And eventually, about 70 years later, women in America gave women the right to vote with the 19th Amendment in 1920. And this is kind of like the... Um, the fight for anything you go for, fight for equality, fight for voting rights, fight for uh, racial equality. We continue to, it, it doesn't, it's not a light switch where you really turn it on and off. It takes a while, at least in America, for this to happen. And you could see again, women's suffrage across the nation prior to this 19th Amendment. Which state was first? Which is the most progressive state that we had? <clears throat> Excuse me. And you could see it was Wyoming in 1869. Wow. In terms of country, what was the first country to give women the right to vote? That was New Zealand. A little, I think it was a little after that, but it was in the 1800s. But New Zealand was the most progressive country to give all women the right to vote. Um, again, it's a struggle over women voters. You could see here Romney and Obama back in 2012. They were trying to pull women to their side. Uh, it's 51% of the population. If you can get women to vote, uh, that, that helped Trump propel, uh, at least white women helped propel Trump to win in 2016. You think they would have gone to Hillary, who's white herself, but it didn't. It went to Trump. Um, again, you can see here, <clears throat> white women without a college degree chose Trump, 62% to 34. You can see the same with white men college graduates, or non-college graduates, 72 percent went with Trump. So uh, let's talk about the from, the from these 40 years, 20 to 60s. This is where the ERA amendment, where now they get the right to vote, now they want equality, you know, can't be denied based on the account of sex. So this has never passed before, but it's gone through two parts. Um, a lot of people thought, saw this as a threat to the family because if we give women equality, then they're in the workplace and then men don't make as much money and so on. You could see the argument from there. But again, it's the idea that this has never happened. It's the Equal Rights Amendment has never happened. And it's kind of gone through the, the, the part where in the 70s, they brought it back and it was defeated again, even though to this day, I think Virginia was the last state to put it through. It's still there's a statute of limitations where you could. it's like you have to do it within seven years. And it took place well, well after the vote. But again, we do have enough today. We'd have to go to a revote, though. So you could see some of the uh, issues that they dealt with Supreme Court cases with Reed v. Reed, Craig v. Boren, the National Organization of Women and Interest Group uh, was, was big in the 70s. The, the feminist movement was, was in the 70s. So you can see, again, uh, this right to equality uh, a second time. I don't want to say it failed, but it didn't, we didn't get the, the amendment. And women are still fighting for their rights to this day. As you can see here, there's the states that ratified it in red, including Texas. But you can see not ratified but approved by one chamber. <clears throat> You're seeing them in green. So women in the workplace, wage discrimination is another one, education and even military service. But you could see, again, women earn about 80 cents to every dollar a man earns. Now, this is really because they compare it at a CEO level. So it's not teacher, female teacher, or male teacher. It's just really at the CEO level. And if a guy's making a million dollars, she's making 800000 So it's showing you that there's no equality within the, the workplace, complete equality. I mean, there's some that women that make more money than men, but on average, this is kind of what it is. Uh, there was an Equal Pay Act, which was supposed to give it, but again, it didn't really work, even though Congress fought for it in the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. And again, you could see men are earning higher than women at every level of educational attainment, a master's, a bachelor's an AA degree, some college certificates, and so on. You can see this. And again, just some cartoons showing you here's a man on dollar, and then you can see a white woman, black woman, Latino woman. Again, all making less and less.
And you can see at least here's somebody who looked at the reverse side of it. Because men make so much money, they're looking up to women here and saying, think of it as a pedestal. Smart, but again, this is not really the equality women are wanting at this point. And again, men are trying to justify why not. I'm not going to go through all the cartoons. Uh, the gender pay gap is narrowing among young adults. Um, then among workers overall, you can see again, 16 or 83 percent of what a man makes and then it's 90 percent for 25 to 34 so it is increasing which is good but it's not really completely equal mothers more than fathers experience career interruptions that's part of the reason why men don't, women might not make as much as men but it's something to think about uh, astronauts again women are starting to do what, what traditional what men had done in the past um, we have uh, soccer teams sports teams well let's look at my one of my favorite sports to watch is national soccer, country versus country. I'm not a club soccer person as much. So the men make considerably way more money than a woman does in soccer, U.S. soccer, national teams. So this is not, obviously not fair, but everyone says, well, men get more people watching it. But let's look at who accomplished what. So here's the pay for you, women national team and men's national team. Friendlies for the women's national team, they make 1300 for a win, 1300 for a win, 1300 for a win, only when they win. Men get $9,300 for a tie or win, a tie, and then you can see a loss, they get almost five times or four and a half times the money. Same thing down the board, but look at the World Cup roster. Women get 15000 men get 68000 So you could see, again, there's not, there's not equality here. Some companies, like I think it was um, Cliff Bar, for women, donated and, and, and he gave enough money to the women's team so they matched the men's pay in the last World Cup that we won. And women have, what, three or four World Cups and the men have none? They've never even been to the finals. So again, you can see, the, the, in terms of performance, you can see who was, um, who was more successful, women by far, by far, guys. And again, you could see again uh, uh, issues with, um, sorry, the phone was ringing. Issues with sports. So you could see basketball, man, woman, man, woman, soccer, man, woman, baseball, ice hockey. Can't even see it. Golf, tennis. They're making money in all the sports. Here's LeBron James again. This was like 2017. I can't find a, a year off hand. Um, I am looking around, but again, you're seeing. Uh, Candace Parker makes this uh, not even close. Cristiano Ronaldo, almost $80 million. Marta, not even maybe a million dollars. Clayton Kershaw, he's not, he's no longer the, the leader for that. And Jenny Finch in softball and so on, guys. I don't have to go through this. You're seeing advertisements and then the salary they make as a player just absolutely just dwarfs the, what the women make. So Title IX in 1972 was part of the educational amendments. And what they use with this is that it's, it's just to protect women from discrimination in college sports. So you could see the other ones at the bottom that they, they were trying to fight for women during this time in terms of uh, stopping discrimination. That's what civil rights are, stopping discrimination against the past episodes of discrimination. We want to stop this from happening. Women are fighting for that. And you can see Title IX um, on Sports Illustrated cover. No person in the United States shall be on the basis of sex excluded or denied the benefits and so on. Uh, again, you can see here, we laud the men, male sports and women, kind of not, not, not that big a deal. This is an older cartoon, obviously. And you can see here, high school participation for females in 71 was 294, 3.6 for males. And then look at this. That is great to see such an increase here um, with women. Same thing here with college participation, such a more of an equity. You gotta have the same number of scholarships for women and men in college. And again, some statistics here on the right for, for Title IX 40 years later. Women have increased, or, or <clears throat> I don't want to say shortened, uh, decreased the gap between men and women. And again, there's the Luna. Oh, it's Luna Bar, not Cliff Bar. I apologize. You can see they gave them each $31,000 for make up the disparity. That was pretty cool to see. So women, they've served in every branch of the government now. They are active duty, 15% of them. They're allowed in the academy since 1975. But only men must register for the draft at this point. Women do not have to. It's called selective service. Men usually receive it at 15 and a half years old. And they have until, I'm sorry, 17 and a half years old. And then they have to send it in. And you're not going to be drafted, guys. We're, we have a volunteer army today. 
It's just if you want to get a grant from the government, they're not going to put you in jail if you don't send it in. You're not going to be able to get stuff from the government unless you sign up for selective service. Now, look, what's changed here? Women used to be forbidden from ground combat. But as long as they can prove that they can carry a 250-pound man off or soldier off of the battlefield, they can serve on the front lines. So it's pretty cool, again, the advancement of women in some capacities. And there you go. That was in 2015. Uh, and then for a million U.S. men, uh, you can see here's the register. If you fail to register, it's not the biggest of deals. But again, you can see some of the consequences. Student aid, citizenship, federal employment, maybe. Again, that's what the card looks like. I don't know if you're going to get the same exact one. I think you can do it online now. Make it even easier. And lastly, for women, is sexual harassment, especially in the workplace. And ever since you can see here, gender discrimination in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you, you, men cannot retaliate if women tell on them. Um, it's obviously in male-dominated fields that, you, that there's a problem, and there's a huge problem in the military as well. And, and just so you understand, this came to America's attention truly, at least when I became an adult, in 1991-92 with Clarence Thomas hearings from Anita Hill. A Supreme Court justice was accused of sexual harassment, not assault, of been dis discussing uh, inappropriate workplace topics uh, pornography to some extent. And um, that was a big issue. So now you're being trained like crazy in the workplace. Every year at, at Westlake myself, I go through training. Everyone goes through training. You have to pass these things so you understand, male and female, what this is and what you, know, what you can and cannot do in terms of protecting individuals. Okay. So the pathway, the e equality of opportunity is a lot for women. You could see it started with voting rights. You can't have gender or based on sex discrimination, sports and pay equity. Again, women are still not completely equal according, you know, you might, I think women are, if not equal with men, if not greater than men, but it's the idea that in terms of on paper, based on statistics, are we, are we equal? And again, genders aren't uh, yet. And hopefully we get to there. All right. So let's talk about some of the other groups under this civil rights umbrella. You have older people, or the graying of America, disabilities, and LGBT plus groups. So with the aging population, they're getting older and older, but they're staying, along, staying alive longer and longer because of, obviously, better health. Um, in this case, 65 was an arbitrary age they used for Social Security. The issue with Social Security is if you can, let's say you want to retire at 65, you can't just get rid of people at 60 and say, we're not going to give you your retirement benefits you're going to have to pay people because it's called ageism. So that's protecting people actually over 40 years old from ageism, which is really interesting because I'm now in that category. But again, it's, it's secure, Social Security is a big issue. You could see, again, people are living longer. The projection is look at all the older people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. In 20, 30 years from now, I'm going to be 80. So I'm going to be in that, in that top group right there, which is kind of interesting to, to, to see that. So when will it run out? Well, actually... I'm 50 now in 2020. That's obviously an older photo of me. But you could see, they say by 2035, we're not going to have enough money. And I will be 65 in 2035. How crazy is that? Now, I'm lucky because I'm a teacher and we don't have, we have a private, not really private, but Texas retire, teacher retirement program. And California had the same kind of thing. So we don't put into Social Security, we put into those two. And that is why I'm happy I don't have to deal with the social security issue, but some of you guys will. And you can see the ratio. It used to be 5.1 in 1960. They, out of their checks and all the money they made, they were helping one person retire. Now it's all the way down, or at least in 10 years from now, it's going to be down to two that are going to help one person retired. So it's just you're paying into someone else who's retired based on the credits that that person accrued during their lifetime. I don't know if it'll be there, guys. But you can see again here that the retirement age between men and women um, and you can see the United States is about almost 65 to 67 ish for men and women is kind of the same, but it's kind of cool to see the comparison to some of the countries, uh, share of the population age 25 or older. Look at Japan. Oh, that's crazy. We're going to be at about 20.9% in 20 and 30 years. So again, I'll be 80 in 2050. Again, it's the burden that these older people are going to have on younger generations. What are we going to do about it? The conservatives have already talked about how Social Security is entitlement and we should get rid of it altogether. But then what about all the people over 50 years of their life that put in all this money to get it out later on? What are you going to do about that? 
that's a tough one as well. All right, let's switch gears. Civil rights and people with disabilities. Obviously, public accommodations need to be accessible. If they are inaccessible, you will be fined and punished and, you know, not receive whatever grants you might be getting until you make and retrofit your, your, your public accommodation. There are legal protections for people with disabilities, federal mandates. You can see from the, those, those laws, especially the ADA, which is the American Disabilities Act of 1990. That's a big one where it's a mandate that you have to comply or you can be sued. You can be fined as well. In terms of equality, more equality, LGBT plus is a newer group. They've been here a while, obviously, but it's been since 2015 in same-sex marriage. It's been a, in, on the forefront. And now the you can see the toughest battle here is homophobia or violence towards any members of these groups. You can see with gay rights movement, look, it went back to 1969, 1986. But yet Obergefell versus Hodges, when it gave same-sex marriage, was until 2015. And now you know that Trump has banned transgender in the military obviously a negative towards this group, but it's one to say, are we, you know, you're going to hear about transgender bathroom issues in different states. We're, it's becoming an issue now that it's in the forefront. Are we going to deal with it as a country? Probably not until it gets to the Supreme Court. So each state's going to have to deal with it, just like they dealt with same-sex marriage for a long time. And then the Supreme Court finally ruled on it in 2015. And you could see here with the pathway, uh, disabled workers prohibit physical and mental discrimination equal access, um, older workers, age discrimination, and then LGBT, just basic civil rights and discrimination. But again, different states are handling those things differently. Okay, affirmative action. I want to make sure you understand what affirmative action is. Uh, we, we're, we're, we have to make up, it's the idea that we have to make up for past discriminations against different groups of people. And again, you can see there's equality of results or quotas or special rules and the controversial stuff. Um, but affirmative action is a set of policies and practices within a government that favors particular groups based on their gender, their race, their creed, and their nationality. Uh, obviously, uh, it's usually this groups that have happened discrimination in the past. We're not going to watch this video. Crash course, I'm going to skip that. But again, you can see affirmative action programs have grown since 2000, from 50, 47 percent to 61 percent. That's minorities, even women are agreeing. People say they uh, favor affirmative action for women and minorities. You could see they agree to some extent. And the famous Supreme Court case is UC Regents versus Bakke, where he, at 35 years old, enrolled in a UC Davis medical school. He had There were 1,600 spots given to the minorities, a part of the affirmative action plan. And Alan Bakke, or Bake, I don't know how you say it really, uh, he met the scores and he actually had better scores than most of the people in the minority program. And he was redirected rejected twice as a result. He contended this in California court and then eventually in federal court and won. Another one was automatically affirmative action programs were given preferential treatment to minority owned firms. Uh, they called this inherently suspect, meaning he had to deal with race. Uh, they voted in favor of Adirond constructions. Another big famous case was a non-minority country company. Again, they have to keep redefining affirmative action and that's what the Supreme Court continues to do. As you can see, there's state bans on affirmative action programs. California's Proposition of 209 said that it would prohibit state governmental institutions from considering race, sex, or ethnicity, specifically in public employment, contracting, and education. You could see here support for Prop 209 uh, back in 20, 1996 and 2014. And again, affirmative action bans in the United States. Look, California, a liberal state. Uh, started the initiative con uh, constitutional amendment for their state to ban affirmative action. So again, they're just going to give you, it should be based on merit, but we're, they're, they're banning it, especially for colleges to some extent. You can see the states that are trying to get involved in that. All right, so that's kind of an overview for affirmative action. Lastly, how do we understand civil rights and public policy? Well, uh, you know, how does it affect our civil rights? Well, Guys, the 14th Amendment changed everything in 1868, but didn't really take get momentum until it seems like the 1950s, the civil rights movement time period. So it's the idea that it's protecting people's equality, which is a democratic principle, equal votes. We have an equal say in our government. To some degree, your one vote is the least you can do to participate in a democracy, uh, free elections. It's the idea that we're allowing people to get there and vote and have a say in what happens to their government. And that's what the 14th Amendment is supposed to do there. So again, one citizen, one vote. It comes from a, a Baker versus Carr case, you have to know. 
uh, conflict with individual liberty, meaning um, just the equality, I mean, the, the equality basic principle of democracy is the idea that we all get a vote. And obviously you want to have complete freedom to be able to vote or do what you say what you want much, but this kind of limits that. We only have that one vote. So again, that's why they're saying, that's why it's a big deal to vote, but yet we don't have great turnouts a lot. It obviously favors the majority rule, but a lot of the times minority, you could say the minority right becomes a little more powerful, especially in the Senate when you can use the filibuster to stop the majority rule from happening. So you could see minorities can threaten the majorities. Women, they're considered a minority, but they're 51% of the population, just because of how they've been treated in the past. African-American majorities in Southern states during segregation, they're there, but again, their vote has been suppressed to some degree in the Southern states. So therefore, is this the election they get out there and get, get as much vote as possible? And we really see how Americans feel about something? Again, the power of the vote is important with civil rights and democracy and ensuring that as well. So what about our scope of government and civil rights? Well, the more our, our courts, the more our Congress and our president fight for civil rights, obviously the scope of government goes up because they're doing more from the federal standpoint than you and taking away from the state uh, uh, choice. Because state, usually, if, remember the 10th Amendment or the reserved powers, meaning if it's not enumerated, it's reserved to the states. So if the state is dealing with equality, I know it comes from the Constitution with the 14th, but again, states have chosen a lot of this stuff, and that's why those cases get to the Supreme Court. They have to rule on that using the 14th Amendment. And that is what the courts have done. The courts have acted the most since the foundation of our country to fight for groups, especially in the 20th century. They're the ones who have fought to protect the rights of people of these groups. Again, you're just seeing that um, the founders didn't really envision this. Again, the idea of civil rights, because the, the 14th Amendment didn't come back until they were all gone, pretty much. Um, you can see it says here, government is not exactly limited when it's discriminated. So when you do keep discriminating, holding people down, the government doesn't really get it. It, it can be over, too powerful. But if you get everyone's vote, like let's say we got 90 to 100 percent turnout for votes, we're truly limiting the government or telling the government we want them to act. Again, you're seeing that. Uh, again, you can see the generational divides in preferred size and scope of government in terms of um, percent of people who prefer bigger government. Look at the millennials. In 2007, they said 68% agree that bigger government's better. The silent generation, tw uh, 25, 27, they want states' rights more often. So you guys can see that. So that is it for today, guys. Uh, that's it for Chapter 5 on civil rights. I will see you on the next one.